Hello, and welcome to another episode of Charles Weekly Partee. I'm Charles, your host, and it's going to be an architecture kind of day, but before we get into that, let's roll the intro. All right, so as promised, or I, I know I've had slightly varying um, promises on the arc episode that was coming up, but today is it. Um, part of the reason for that is I did end up having to juggle around my calendar a little bit, and I was actually supposed to have Michael on this week, except he was on last week, which was a really great episode, and I encourage you to check it out, number 2133. Another thing I had mentioned is that I had a sort of schematic for the remainder of the year, and now I'm happy to be announcing the basics of that schematic. So it actually works out pretty well in my notes. There are going to be three more sort of regular episodes, all right? So this one is not counted in that, but after this, there will be three more sort of your normal sort of architecture and tech episodes. Assuming the uh, world does go the way I want it to, which we've seen doesn't always happen. After that, there will be two sort of special feature episodes, and I'll leave a little bit of a surprise for that. And lastly, we have the season finale, which will be episode 2140, and among other things, I'll be announcing the plans for winter break during that. And spoiler alert, I am thinking there are going to be... um, I've leaned towards the idea of having some sort of episode during winter break. However, I'm going to need that as a break. So I'll let you uh, think, I'll let you guys think about what exactly I'm alluding to, but the final plans will be announced in the season finale. Now, I wanted to talk about architecture, and I've had various minds of what to talk about. I saw houses, I saw um, companies, I saw all the, all the fun stuff, but then I saw schools. And I thought that would be an interesting thing to focus on because schools are always pretty interesting, pretty in-depth, and have a lot more meaning to... I er, have to be careful here, but they, they have a lot a lot more incentive to go correctly as po- as or be designed as best possible because I don't remember who made the quote, but there's a quote of um, we shape architecture, which in turn shapes us, or we shape our buildings, which in turn shapes us. Um, I don't I don't remember who exactly is responsible for that quote, but it's actually pretty entertaining. And I think schools are really a good example of that because if you look at a school, that school determines whether or not you're going to have a good time, have an enjoyable experience, all that fun stuff. And the other thing that the school determines is your future. If you go to a state-of-the-art school um, with modern learning platforms, everything's brand new, you have access to all the resources you could possibly hope for, you're going to have a really good chance at success. But if you go to a school that isn't so great with limited or no resources and no versatility, that's not going to be a good experience and in turn, it's just not going to be beneficial or as beneficial as some of the other ones. Now, without getting into the whole debate on whether or not everyone should go to college, and I can honestly say I don't think college is for everyone. However, um, the better schools are more likely to or the better or schooling environments are more likely to have someone end up in a better education position. So they may go to 
a prestigious university or er, and whatnot. Or they might go and I, I don't know what the word is for it. They, they might go to other wonderful colleges and schools and then afterwards have all the resources to be able to get a job and ha have a good, fun, and productive life, not having to think about stuff. And that's all determined by the school. So when they, when they say our schools sort of shape us, they, they're not wrong. I've been in every type of school building. I've been in, what, what was it? My early schooling was done in, what was it? Build, I, it my early schooling was done in, I think, 1960s era buildings. 19, maybe 1970s. Basically not the most modern in the world, but not ancient ones. Also on that list was, um, how do you call it? After that early schooling, I spent a year in a significantly older um, school building. One that, was, one that was designed before ADA accessibility was a thing and, um, really in the era of fallout shelter designs and more fun stuff along those lines. But also noting out that it, even though it was an older building, the heat worked really well, as it usually does in those older buildings, but it had a lot of stairs. And there, there's, I felt bad for the person who got stuck on crutches because they had to go from the cafeteria in the basement to a class on the third floor. And without an elevator, you can imagine that was not a fun experience. But only spent one year in that building. And then we ended up moving it to a refurbished building, which, or well, renovated building, used to be an office building, then they repurposed it as a school. But it, it was basically uh, hand-me-down hand everything. They took a bunch of the furniture with us. And I, overall, I can't say it was, that was a great school experience. It was literally just a building. There's no architecture to it. The last building I spent my early schooling in, and by early I mean K through 12, was, uh, what was it? It was a brand new building designed as a school, designed with all the uh, resources and amenities you could um, imagine with a couple cut for cost-saving reasons, which is unfortunately all too common in the educational system. And that, that was my favorite of them because, it, and not just because it was, hey, we're, mo we're going to be the first ones going into this building. It was because that was the first time I was in a facility designed from the floor to the ceiling or floor to ceiling education and we want to make this as enjoyable of an experience as possible and I don't I don't know what it was but that that was my favorite time everything was just a lot more a lot more fun and a lot more manageable and I don't know what it was but it had something to do with the way the building was designed so when I talk about the um, Jean-Louis Etienne School, or actually, I, I, I took maybe half a year of French. I'm not great at it. As you could tell, I might be able to tell this is designed in France. But, um, I think Jean-Louis Etienne School, 
is actually how you're supposed to pronounce it. And it was designed by Archi5, and it's located in Couvray, France. Now, this was definitely a much different approach to schooling than, um, than the conventional um, yesteryear approach. First and foremost, the facility is beautiful and designed, once again, as a school, not repurposed for anything and not done as cheaply as possible but designed to be able to sort of grant meaning to everything you're doing, from walking, uh, from walking to your classroom to enjoying recess to um, leaving at the end of the day. The entire school is well designed to be able to do all of it. And when I, when I say beautiful, where am I going with that? Well, it's one level for the most part, except there are a couple of spots where there are indeed two levels. And that's on one wing and in the sort of lodging area, which drew a question mark in my head. But that's, that was put there for some reason or another, and I'm not, enti I'm not entirely sure what, but I think... That it's not going to be put in there just meaninglessly. The other thing is that that lodging area is only accessible from the outside of the building. So from that area, you cannot walk directly into the school building. You need to actually walk outside of that and walk in. So it's sort of separate but connected. Under the same roof, but there's a wall in between that you just can't do much about. Now, what really struck me as being interesting was the layout of the school. It wasn't just a, um, what's the word for it? It wasn't just a sort of branch design. And it wasn't just a, it, it wasn't taking a gigantic, um, what's designed as an office space and turning it into a school either where you have windowless classrooms, which aren't, which aren't exactly as much fun as they'd sound, even though the stuff going on outside of the windows, especially, God forbid, snow, ends up being distracting. You, even though you have all those distractions, it's just so much nicer to have natural, um, natural light accessible to you. And having, having this sort of classrooms uh, set up, all of the classrooms have natural light. Yes, there are wings, but it isn't just a one main hallway and let's branch the rest of the wings off of that. Rather, it's one, or rather it's a sort of looping shape to it with it's, everything's just connected and it's flowing which also ends up alluding to the flow of time because if you think about it through educational uh, cycles in kindergarten life is easy right you start off your day you do a little bit of this you practice how to do it, right you learn some basics of how things work and at the end of the day, you get to go home and have fun. You don't, it's sort of getting you used to the idea of school without doing too much in the way of making your, or making your life harder, forcing you to do a whole bunch of uh, learning and all that jazz. After you get past kindergarten though, it starts changing a little bit. As you go through the grades, progressively you change from kindergarten where everything's happy and fun and you look forward to going to school in the day. Um, the hardest work you do is maybe um, writing a couple of paragraphs, or write a couple of paragraphs, 
maybe writing a paragraph. I remember the, like, the one thing we did in kindergarten that stuck out was that we had a, what's the word for it? We had this beautiful, so I can't figure out the word. We had, we had a fun time where our, all the students sort of wrote books. Um, if you aren't watching the video, I did um, some air quotes there. But we made these cute little books that all in all were maybe a paragraph. And just looking, looking at it, it's like one line on each page. That, that, I think, was the biggest project we had in kindergarten. Don't ask how I can still remember that. I'm not entirely sure. But as time went on, things started getting harder. We, in um, first and second grade, we sort of did the same bookmaking thing, except it was more writing. Had a lot of reading to do. Started working with a little bit more on the turn side of math. All that fun stuff. And learning a little bit more about how everything was going on. I remember in um, my early elementary school, or school years, can't remember exactly what grade it was, we had a sort of mock election where everyone got to uh, sort of mark down who they voted for. Obvi er, who, well, who they would vote for. It was meant just to be a sort of playful election. But I can't say I was entirely um, looking at that piece. I don't, I, I can remember I was going through my head. I all I thought about were two guys I saw on TV and tried to, I didn't recognize what either of the names meant and basically basically tried to, or just marked one of the boxes and called it a day. And some people, I might argue, actually do vote that way, which, um, without getting into it too much, actually, Election Day was this past week for, um, for those of us in America. And... I'd say, without going too far into it, the fact that it is, I guess we, we learned early on that it was both a right and a responsibility. You were allowed to vote, but in that early elementary school, we were told, here's your slip, go uh, mark it and we'll see who does it. Like in, even in, um, even in high school, we had a mock presidential election. And at the end of the day, they announced the school results. And funny enough, just a couple days later, after the um, election results had been sort of figured out, it was actually contrary to what the school had voted for. But that's the way things end up working out. But the fact that it's taught is an important from an early standpoint from an early point, I think is actually pretty entertaining and pretty useful. So we talk about how education needs to sort of prepare people and thinking back on it, that prepared me for getting to where I am now. I mean to this day. I have voted in every single election that I had the opportunity to vote in. And not a, there are some people who just go in there, check off names, call it a day. Some people vote party line, some people don't. Or some people just, I don't know who these are, I'll just vote for whomever or not vote or not put them on the ballot. But altogether, the whole right and responsibility and what I pulled most from that experience early on is I want to know who I'm voting for. I don't remember in that early election 
whose name I checked off. Nor do I think it really matters. What the, the lesson that I drew from it was when you're voting, whenever I vote, I want to know who's running and I want to learn a bit about them and the platform that they're running on. So that I can, after doing the poking around, I can make an educated decision as to whom I'm, vo or who I'm, who I'm endorsing for office, in essence. And that's, that's what I do every single election. Find out who's on the ballot, do the research, and get that done. All because of something I learned in elementary school. And I think that that one life experience just changed the, changed the way, or changed, changed isn't the right word, sort of shaped who I am today, which is really what elementary school is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be teaching you good character, good this, good that, and the bulk of the early schooling is to try and give you an understand, or start to give you an understanding of how the world around you functions, but simultaneously give the chance to sort of make mistakes in a controlled environment so that later on in life you can look back and say, wasn't too thrilled with that decision and by the simple mistakes that we make early on, we're encouraged to do better later. All comes down to proper schooling, but having the proper building for it makes it a lot better. Now, realizing that I went on a tangent for the last several minutes, um, going back to the building and the or sort of the unique shape sort of being responsible for shaping everyone and recognizing that everyone may get the same lessons, but they may pull different things and be shaped differently from them. And that's all alluded to in this design. The shaping, the shelter through time, how kindergarten you're sheltered, and by the time you graduate high school, you sort of know what's going on in the outside world. That's why it's also shaped from one story to slowly incorporate um, two stories in it, because there's that key difference between showing you start off small and you, you grow up through time. You go on this path of education, you go from having a small understanding to having a much larger understanding of how the world around you works. And all of that is communicated with one building shape, and it's absolutely incredible. Um, something else I wanted to note out is with a more modern school, you also have the advantage of modern furniture. And you may not think that that's a huge deal, but it goes without saying that the comfort of the chair that you sit in to learn something makes a lot of difference in how you handle the lecture material or the learning material. It also can make a big difference in between how boring a subject really is. Or it could even detriment to what would otherwise have been an interesting subject. If you think about it, if you're sitting on a very uncomfortable metal stool with no back for hours on end, well, you're going to be thinking about that stool sooner or later. And if someone's talking to you, if you have to sit on a hard metal stool for hours on end that doesn't have a back to it, the only thing you're going to be thinking about at the end of those hours is this is very, very uncomfortable. And if you're sitting in a nice, comfortable chair that provides breathability where necessary and keeps you sort of warm, 
It's a little bit cooler. I don't know if you can hear it right now, but there's heat on in the background. And I actually, I actually am wearing a, uh, I wish I'd worn a sweater today, but accidental decisions. And now that I mentioned the heat being on, the whole thing turned off. So time to get just a little bit chillier. I just don't like the idea of recording in or wearing a jacket. More noises from the heating system. Hey, that wasn't an invitation to make more noises. Okay, well, if that's gonna keep clicking, this is gonna be really interesting. So here, here goes. The biggest difference between a sort of new building and an older building with schools is largely the furniture. A building designed from scratch usually will have brand new furniture put into it, and that ends up being much more beneficial to the students actually learning in there because new furniture has the advantage of the knowledge that we have now about ergonomics. I think one of the most famous studies is the um, Eames chair. If you've ever had a chance to sit in one of those, those are, that is the most comfortable chair I've ever sat in. And I'm, I'm not talking about the sort of plastic one, I'm talking about the wooden one with the um, one piece shaped seat made out of wood and the back to it. Those chairs do such a good job at keeping you comfortable that you actually have, it's actually significantly harder to get out of the chair than it is to get into them. And newer school furniture has more of that ergonomics knowledge in place and has more, more versatility to it so that more students will be able to not think about the chair that they're sitting in being uncomfortable, but also having the ability to, I don't know what the word is for it, but also having the ability to have sort of flexible classroom arrangements. So I'm sure we can all think back to some, uh, some point with schooling where you have chairs that are attached to the desks. And what that does is it basically says, here's your chair, here's the back, here's the desk. No versatility to it. I think the demonstration of how much school furniture has changed is absolutely enormous. And there's actually some school furniture that I've sat in that I would actually buy. Actually, there's some school furniture that I've seen in modern school buildings that I've seen in corporate environments as well. And that just shows that you have something that's at the level of comfort as you'd expect in the working world. Because in the working world, you want your employees to be somewhat comfortable because if they aren't comfortable, they are not going to be as productive as they otherwise should be. And if there's that deliberation of, should I get up and get a little bit more coffee or get another snack? That makes it a lot easier, except in an education environment, usually you have to stay sitting in that chair, which means the more uncomfortable it is, the more resentment you get for whatever chair you're sitting in and the less you're thinking about what's actually being taught. doesn't matter if it's uh, world history, um, the exciting, uh, whatever exciting thing is going on in the world. Maybe, maybe you're learning about sharks or maybe you are learning how a plant grows. No matter what, the less comfortable you are, the less you're likely to pull from the actual class. And furniture actually play, plays a very big role in that because that's how, because discomfort sort of takes precedent of mind. And part of that is natural human instinct because usually if you're not comfort, or if you're not very comfortable, something's not good. That, that's the, that's a natural response to making sure that you are giving yourself the environment that you're, it's what nature has to make sure that you have the environment you need to survive. 
So if you're uncomfortable, maybe you're too cold, that means you need to get something or make yourself a little bit warmer so that you aren't uh, losing too much heat. All that fun stuff. But enough, of, enough about furniture and um, how important being comfortable is to proper education. I do want to spend a couple more minutes talking about this and how there's actually pretty great materiality to it. And having, having that sort of great materiality really contributing to the classroom environment. Wood is a very particular, a very particularly beneficial material for um, for people because it it's a lot more natural. And I don't know all of the different benefits right offhand, but I know it's one of the best materials that you can use for a variety of reasons. Now, one of the primary materials that is used in this building is actually wood, and it's stunningly beautiful. We can all think back to the point in time where there was wood paneling in almost every person's um, living room. And most of us haven't thought that, that that really looks all that great, or especially nowadays. Now, if someone sees the wood paneling, their thought process is generally to remove it. And Having this sort of more natural wood feel to it is, I think we're, we're toying with ideas, but at the same time, we need to be careful with it because having the right wood finishes is absolute, just makes things beautiful. The wrong wood finish makes, or can make things feel old fashioned and really, really quickly. But that's why this combination in materials. One of the other materials that's used in this is, um, I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was a local, local sort of stone, but having a sort of stone mesh on the exterior of the building actually just beyond looked, or it looks great. So if I have it somewhere, um, yeah, it's it's a sort of stone stone brick with a little little bit of a grayish blue tint to it, but that th there's just no no words to describe how well everything works together. Having the glass, er, having the beautiful trio of stone, glass, and wood. There is some metal in the mullions, but it's not a big focus point. And just having that sort of st stone wood, and, uh, stone wood and glass as the primary materials is pretty beautiful. Nice, simple, straightforward, and I, I think all in all, it gives, it produces a very beautiful, very beautiful learning environment. Now, Last but not least, um, did want to mention the courtyard involved in it. I think I, I think I made it some sort of mention earlier about it being directly accessible from the classrooms with an organic shape. But it also features a couple, it's featured to be a little bit more natural so that you're not, the main focus isn't the, um, isn't just a big, playing field made out of concrete or asphalt, but rather your uh, learning and your outdoor environment has the same natural feel to it with um, some natural specimens in the center with a couple of areas where you can just sit down, get a rest that are also sheltered from the elements. So maybe, maybe you're feeling a little bit too warm, you can sit down outside of the sun without any issue. Obviously, if it's raining, there's not too, too much you can do, but here we are. All in all, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up with the simple party of how education, how 
the building that we're being educated in actually makes a big difference in how we're educated and what we learn from it. Because if, if you're uncomfortable during history class, maybe you'll get the feeling that you don't like history when in reality you would have actually really loved history. And let having a building being the determining factor for that is incredible food for thought, but it also means that architects have an incredible job of making sure that the buildings that they design are designed with the repercussions in mind of what happens if they aren't designed well. Because the last thing we want is for a whole generation of students to not to not have the necessary tools to succeed because of a building. Not because of architectural mistakes, but because they were in a building and not a piece of architecture. I think um, as school buildings need to be replaced and modified, taking these considerations into account will actually make life a lot better. So if you enjoyed this episode, and in, I'm sure in future episodes I'll be able to talk about a school and some degree of educational technology, which is actually a big part of education today, well, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of those future episodes. Also, if you go to anchor.fm slash charlesweeklypartt, you'll be able to listen to all previous episodes of the podcast as well as interacting with voice messages and you can always support the podcast, which really helps out a lot. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please be sure to leave a review. It helps us out a lot. And you can always see the action on YouTube if just hearing my voice isn't um, doesn't quite do it for you. So take care. I do hope you enjoy your day. And let's roll the outro. Thank you.